The title of my presentation is not losing your way, but losing our way in education. And uh, what's, your, what's your favorite TV program at the moment? Anybody? Lost? Mine, mine used to be Project Runway. It probably still is. But um, uh, I've just started to enjoy Justified. So last night, after watching Justified, I wrote a little paragraph that I could start out my uh, talk with. I am here today, Raylan Givens, to give you hope on the fulfillment spiral to excitement and the acquisition of new knowledge for you. To tell you that it is possible to go from fear to desire, relief, trust, and yes, be excited about your education. Probably what's too much justified, but. So, um, so I am in mechanical engineering material science. I'm a chemist by training, and I've kind of done a lot of different things. And along the way, I did start thinking about what it is we're actually trying to do. So I'll tell you about this new activity. It's been actually been going on for 10 years now about developing educational methodologies that we can share with our students. So what do we really want to do? Develop deeper learning, problem solving skills, critical thinking, and even become an inventor yourself. In the program it said I'd invented a cancer treatment. Um, that's still in trials, I've had a lot of help to do that, but being an inventor, having ideas, maybe something we want our students to, uh, to aspire to. So in 2005, uh, I uh, was interested in this abalone shell. So you can see the iridescence, and the reason it's iridescent is because calcium carbonate is um, precipitated in these layers, and so light comes in, it gets reflected or refracted and then reflected, and you get that iridescence. So this course, I called it biomineralization, and I could just walk into the classroom and say, today, we're going to cover precipitation. We'd cover it with letters and numbers that might not mean much to anybody. What if we uncovered precipitation? If we uncovered it with an experiment, discovered precipitation in the lab? So it took a, several days to take a solution, add it to another solution, and out pops some crystals. Those crystals grow over a period of, say, 40 minutes, and we can plot the rate at which those crystals grow. Now, I could have probably given this lecture on precipitation in maybe 45 minutes, but it took us about a week to do this. Speaking of covering something, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Richard Felder. He's at uh, North Carolina uh, State University in chemical engineering, and he had this quote that said, our second worst assumption as teachers is that if we don't cover something in class, the students won't learn it. Our worst assumption is if we do, they will. And so was born this thing I called EDUC. It's basically our research paradigm mapped on to the learning of students. So they could learn by experiment, discovery, uncovery, leading to their new knowledge. Experiment, discovery, uncovering new knowledge. If there are any pattern recognition people in here, you'd see Duke in there somewhere. So then I asked the question, how much of what we present in, say, a 34-course curriculum is actually learned by the students? I asked the professors, they said 20%, students 10, and one kid at the back said 10. So would, would students learn and retain more if we presented less, but they experimented and discovered for themselves? This is anecdotal, but I would suggest if we drop the curriculum in half, the students might have more time to truly learn more information. That requires more resources, labs, design studios, pilot plants. Um, instead of a, a class with an add-on lab, what about a lab with an associated class? And even virtual labs. So I've been interested in nature's designs as inspiration even for this cancer treatment, and that's probably another talk. I actually had two talks I could give today. One of them could have been losing our way in chemotherapy and how we might change the way we treat cancer. This is education. So I was interested in nature's designs and the problems that nature had solved. 
So as a chemist coming into engineering, I learned some engineering to teach it, and I thought, what if we map all of engineering onto all of biology? What would we get? Well, this is what we got. I asked the question, how did nature solve its problems? Here's one example that I use as a template. How did nature solve the oxygen delivery problem? Well, what is that problem? It's a low solubility of oxygen in water, and it's a low transport by diffusion. So as a single cell, you can survive, but as the number of cells gets bigger, the oxygen can't get in, and oxygen is used up, and you need a vascular system. So the answer to that is nature solved the problem with a cardiovascular system. Now we can think of this in hierarchical terms. And nature naturally divides up into a macro, micro, and nano scales. The macro scale might be the actual art arteries and, and veins. The micro scale could be a red blood cell and capillaries. And the nano scale would be the hemoglobin that transports the oxygen. We might also ask the question, what are the problems nature still has in disease? And one of the problems could be that in the sixth position of the beta chain of hemoglobin, a glutamic acid, amino acid, is actually substituted by valine. And in low oxygen, that hemoglobin polymerizes, those cells sickle, and a large African-American male falls over in painful crisis with sickle cell disease. So this was a neat way of representing nature's designs and problems nature still has, say, for biomedical engineers or for pre-medical students. So here we can actually um, look at how nature re uh, uh, designs something and reverse engineer it, and we'll get to the, the methodology in a minute, in a very formal way. I also realized that we were losing our way in our engineering curriculum. All the prerequisite courses and classes that you take in order to then um, be, uh, be an engineer, um, there's an old joke. Uh, how many engineering students does it take to change a light bulb? How many first year engineering students does it take? None, it's not on the curriculum yet. How many second year engineering students does it take? One, and the rest of the class copies. How many third year engineering students does it take? Is it on the quiz? How many fourth year engineering students does it take? I don't care, I'm out of here. And uh, you know, there's Freud said there are uh, many true words in jokes. But if uh, we take all of engineering again and map it onto engineering and recapture what it is to be an engineer that produces products and processes for the benefit of society, I ended up starting in an ME 101 thermodynamics course. Now this is a very intense course on first, second, third laws of thermodynamics, Carnot cycle, energy cycles. It's pretty heavy duty stuff. And so we got students to reverse engineer a diesel engine, a gasoline engine, a refrigerator, an air conditioner, humidifier, power plant, steam engine, and a turbine. So uh, these students, in just a few hours uh, a week, actually after spring break, they, they did for themselves something that the professor could not give them by teaching at them. They learned engineering concepts and principles and fundamentals and um, the process of engineering design with tangible aspects like working together. So here's a summary of the four key components that I think I've developed and you'd probably find um, corollaries or different people have done similar things. But if I look at the traditional way and what students actually call the new way and just these four simple um, uh, components. Core content is your curriculum, and that's obviously in traditional education. And it's obviously in our new way. What doesn't tend to happen in traditional education where you're being lectured at is that there's actually a content framework that that material is placed in. It's often only when you finish the four years do you realize what all those lectures meant and what even all those courses meant. You can then synthesize that and put that together. So in an educational program, you really want a content framework, and I've chosen design. There's obviously teaching involved, dissemination of information. That can come just by reading the book, or it could come by the professor reading the book, making notes, writing on the board. You write down those notes, and you answer the quizzes, and go back to the book if you don't understand something. So there's always teaching, and I don't throw that out, and we'll see how I'm going to use teaching. And then the other thing would be 
this active learning, this experiment, this discovery, your uncovery of principles with experts leading to your new knowledge. So here we are at Duke in the Pratt School of Engineering. And on the websites, you'll see pictures of kids really enjoying themselves. And with 50% of our students are actually now doing independent study. But this is how they spend most of their time. So here's your 34 course curriculum. Anybody doing engineering? This is your mechanical engineering curriculum, right? And the belief is that by going through this curriculum, we'll produce mechanical engineers, and we definitely do that. But I asked, could we produce engineers with maybe deeper learning? Can we improve the quality of the engineering graduates we create? Could they actually be problem solvers, critical thinkers, and inventors? And what would it take to do that? In higher education, then, it's a problem. It's a problem at Duke. It's a problem everywhere. How do we go from this, because of this, to something a little bit more fun? This is when I used to teach. This is in 2006. We had a class called Mapping Engineering onto Biology. I would give these lectures, and then the students in groups of four would reverse engineer problems nature solve themselves. This program, it, uh, we did about 200 projects with over 600 students. In the old days, what the professor was tasked to do was to explain the book. But now, 10 years, I know Google. <laughs> Students can explore, they can discover, they can uncover principles themselves. This information is just a click away. We couldn't do this 10 years ago. If you wanted to find any information, you had to walk to a library. Now, you just click on colloid stability or dance or whatever, and up comes a huge amount of information. The task now is to use that resource of information, but ask specific questions of it so that you can learn when you want to learn. So this leads to their new knowledge. And uh, a few years ago, I saw a girl with a, uh, a sweatshirt on, and it said, Coach K puts the K into Duke. And I asked her then, who puts in the EDU? So could we even go to this? Could we have classrooms now that are not banked uh, chairs like this, but actually tables, working environments? We did create the link. And the link is a place now where the sage on the stage is replaced by the guide by the side, where teaching at students is actually replaced by the facilitated learning of students with students. So we'd still want to keep passive learning. So could we do lecture at home? I tell students when you join this class, we're going to do a lecture at home. I'm not going to come to your dorm room and give you a lecture. It turns out we've got technology. It's called Camtasia or, or other programs where I can record a lecture. So yes, we can. How would we use that in an active learning sense? We could do lecture at home. What about homework in class with the professor? When I mentioned this to the professors, they're confused. They say, but if we're going to do lecture at home, what do we do in the classroom? What we've done in the classroom is reverse engineer problems that engineers have already solved because they were not solved by you and because we know all the answers. So we could solve problems of design engineering, we could manufacturing, consulting, um, the uh, installing, and then even educating. So this is what our classrooms look like now. And actually, I was on a Velux Award in Denmark at Copenhagen's pharmacy school. Reverse engineering problems pharmacists solved and haven't solved. So you're all wondering, what is reverse engineering? So it's a methodology that we'd use to ask questions of a device. So maybe we'll start you off. What questions would you want to ask to reverse engineer this plastic cup to learn more about it? Anybody? What do you say? How big, around it is. How big around it is? So some of the dimensions. Anybody else? Yeah. <coughs> what does it do? What is it for? Sure. How are the materials made or where does it? Yeah, what is it made of or how are the materials formed? How is it produced? It's a very intuitive thing once you start to engage in this process. So the answers are on the next slide. What is it for? How should it work? What is it made of? What are the characteristics of the material? How is it made? Has anybody made anything similar? Patents. And does it really work? Congratulations, you've just reverse engineered a plastic cup. So what about doing this for anything that you're interested in? 
We can take this formal scheme of reverse engineering now and apply it to anything that you see around you or you want to learn about, even organizations of people. So here are the last couple of slides on the elements of this educational method, that I might call it. Content is the curriculum. The framework is this, what we just did. If you can read this, there is what is it for, some of the laws, theories, and models associated with its performance, the um, uh, component design, the materials, analyzing those materials in that design to achieve those functions, the specification sheet, which then goes to the production, prototypes, performance in service, and the last box is further development. Are you either inspired to create something new uh, through a new component design or a new material or apply it to a completely different application? This EDUC pedagogy, it looks linear when I write it as EDUK, but it's a cycle. And the more times you go around that cycle, ever increase in knowledge spiral. So this is the intellectual content now placed in the context of design. So has anybody asked this question? Why are you here? Big question. But why are you actually do? Why are you taking the classes you're taking? What is it that you want to achieve? Why are we putting this knowledge in your head anyway? So here's a um, not anatomically correct picture of your head with your IQ. And 120 or 140 IQ, it doesn't matter if you're 150, 60, 80, you'll not necessarily innovate anymore with more IQ. So your curriculum, our pedagogy of learning now, and our content framework of design puts new knowledge under your IQ. In fact, as you've been sitting here, your IQ is like a bird on a wire. It's zipping around, trying to figure out, making connections with what I'm saying and what you're seeing with your already uh, experience, uh, knowledge. Out will come ideas, though, inventions. So this is an invention generator. One final uh, thought is our chance to influence. I play darts. In fact, one of my most recent inventions is this little device that I call dart side, probably my pocket. You put it on your finger and you line up the dart uh, and it improves your aim and accuracy. So I've been interested for a while in the perfect parabola. And what I realized was that the only chance I have to influence where that dart ends up is when I have hold of the dart. It may seem obvious. But what if we apply that to education? So we facilitate students learning in a fashion that matches seamlessly with their career paths upon graduation. So you arrive at Duke. Maybe you take a, this more educational curriculum and you graduate and we launch you on a path as biomedical engineers, civil, environmental, electrical, or mechanical engineers. So maybe we could change the name of the School of Engineering from the uh, Edmund T. Pratt Jr. School of Engineering to a school of problems engineers solve and parenthetically haven't solved. Because I'll bet if you do three years of design-oriented uh, curriculum, the fourth year problems engineers haven't solved, now your design makes sense. So I'd be very happy, uh, we're having lunch, I guess, to talk to anybody who is, in, in, who is uh, interested in developing any of these methods, applying them to anything in Trinity Arts and Sciences, whether it's um, uh, nature, chemistry, physics, biology, women's studies. It's your education. Thank you.